Hello, I'm Michelle McCory. Thank you for joining us. Why is the price of Bitcoin down following that historic approval by the SEC of 11 spot Bitcoin ETFs? Bitcoin ETFs had a larger AUM than silver ETFs the instant the SEC approved them. So why has Bitcoin dropped around 80% from its recent highs of around $49,000? Well, my next guest correctly called that Bitcoin was likely to sell off on the news of a spot Bitcoin ETF approval the last time that he was on the show about two months ago. And he also correctly pointed out prior to the approval that 48,000 to 50,000 would be a key resistance level for Bitcoin. So let's get his thoughts on what's next for Bitcoin, as well as his updated macro outlook. Kitco fan favorite Gareth Soloway. Gareth is the president of VerifiedInvesting.com and chief market strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com. Always good to have you back, Gareth. Oh, so good to be back. Thanks for having me, Michelle. All right. So, Gareth, you called it. You were expecting a sell-off after we got news of the approval. Now, there was a lot of factors at play here. So why don't you start by breaking down some of what the factors are that's been bringing the price of Bitcoin down? Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's take a look at the chart here. And I think this is really telling and, and, and makes people understand what really went on. And so if we just look at the history, and I'm, I'm a technician, meaning I look at data sets to kind of predict the future. And that's really how I come to these conclusions. So if we go back to the 2017 Bitcoin bull market high, that was when the futures were approved, right? They basically debuted. So there was a lot of hype that took us up into that news. And then what happened, that was the high of the cycle. If we go to the first high in 2021, that was the IPO of Coinbase that debuted and that marked that high. We had a correction to 30,000. We then go to the second high in later in 2021, and that was the ETF for the futures, uh, Bitcoin, right? And that marked that high as well. And so if you just look at that kind of consistency that these big news stories that create so much hype create the top on Bitcoin, it makes sense why that would be the key level there or why it would sell off on the news. Now, you can talk about GBTC, obviously right. selling Bitcoin. Um, there was a lot of smart money that that bought ahead of this news. GBTC was trading at a big discount, so it was kind of an extra bonus to them as well. And they're basically just at the point of taking profits. They, they know the run-up is now in play. They know that the general consensus of retail investors will be to take a little bit off the table. And that just creates this back testing, this, this move back to the downside. Now, just in terms of the forty eight to 50000 level, what's fascinating here is if we do a Fibonacci retrace, right? So we take the high of 69,000, the low to the absolute low of this bear market here, which was around 15,000 and change. Notice that the 618 Fibonacci trend line here, that's exactly the high there. And lastly, that's, and I'm just showing you how I kind of arrived at that 48 to 50,000 level. If we take the 2019 high, connect it through the lows of the, of the bull market right here, we actually get that same level. And so when I get confluence of levels, that's really where I start to say, okay, this is going to be a major level of resistance. And sure enough, it was. Right. And you call that correctly. Before we break that down a little bit more and focus on the TA, I want to help our viewers understand exactly what the situation is with the grayscale outflows. Because in terms of demand, Fidelity and BlackRock, they're dominating the Bitcoin ETF flow race, about $1.9 billion, $1.6 billion of inflows, respectively. That's according to Bloomberg data. Both ETFs currently accounting for about 70% of inflow so far, pretty much as expected that the big players would, would lead the race here. But then what, on the other side of the spectrum, we've got the Grayscale Fund turned ETF, and it was going into it, the largest cryptocurrency fund with about $22 billion in assets under management, but it saw $4 billion of outflows since it converted into an ETF. Now, we obviously have a situation where their fee is higher. They have a high fee of 1.5%, much higher than the competitors. For example, BlackRock and Fidelity's fees are 0.25%, so a quarter of a, ba a, quarter of a percentage point, 25 bips after a waiver period. So explain that dynamic. Help our viewers understand what's happening with outflows from grayscale and inflows into these other bigger ETFs. 
Yeah, so so what's going on here is, and you're right about the fees, right? GBTC is a much higher fee, so there's going to be a certain amount of money that is going to sell the GBTC and then eventually rotate into these other ETFs that have much, much lower fees. And I also think there was just, I mean, really, if you looked at how could you participate in your investment account at various brokers where you buy stocks, the only game in town was GBTC at the time, right? I mean, that's really all there was. It was either that or you go to the futures market or you go to Bitcoin itself on the spot spot market. So there was a lot of money that chased Bitcoin in knowing that it would run up into the ETF approval. And it's just natural that you get this letdown where people say, okay, let me take some off the table here. Let me take my profits after such a mammoth run. So it's a combination of the two. You have the selling because of the fee factor and also just profit taking in general, which again, you can go to any asset class and you see these crazy runs. There's going to be a certain amount of profit taking that takes place. So at what point do you think does this balance out? Does the outflow from Grayscale because of those higher fees and profit taking balance out with this wave of institutional demand that we've been expecting to come with these spot Bitcoin ETF approvals? So it should be sooner than later. I do think that within probably the next couple of weeks, it will balance out. My bigger fear, though, and this is this is the one bearish case that I have for Bitcoin, is that what happens if we get a market top in the S&P? What happens if we get a de-risking event in the overall markets, in the equity markets? And that then could also stall money from flowing into these new ETFs if people start to get scared. So right now, we know new all-time highs almost daily on the S&P and the NASDAQ 100, and that's great. But why is Bitcoin stalling out here? Okay, it's the GBTC selling of Bitcoin. That gives us that reasoning. But what again, if we start to see the market sell off? And the one thing I'd like to point out to viewers here, which I think is really important is that if you look at the past cycles on Bitcoin, so Bitcoin's topped out in December of 2017, the S&P topped out six weeks later in early 2018. If you go to 2021, the $69,000 high, the, the high was put in in November. It was right at the end of December, six weeks later that the S&P topped out. So I'm a little bit on alert here to say, okay, let's watch now three weeks. We're basically three weeks into since the spot ETF was approved. What happens over the next three plus weeks? Do we see a stock market top and do we see a correction there? And that would be another reason why you could argue that Bitcoin still has some downside to go. Right. Um, but again, as you quite rightly pointed out, S&P hitting new all-time highs, NASDAQ 100 hitting new all-time highs, defying conventional wisdom, defying expectations. So on the flip side of that case, if we continue to see equity markets rally, does Bitcoin catch up? Yeah, yeah. So I think so. I think I think if we continue, I mean, if we just continue to grind higher in the S&P and the NASDAQ, eventually the risk on trade takes back over, absorbs all the GBTC selling pressure and, and ultimately pushes Bitcoin back up. So it's, it's really the one case where Bitcoin could sell off is only if we see an equity market top. Now, if we direct our attention to my charts here, I just want to show you guys this because to me, all the narrative is in the mainstream media is that the markets are just gangbusters. Everything's just going higher. If we look at this, this is all the sectors in the S&P 500. And if we look going back to 2020 or 2019, if you look at all the other sectors except technology, we've basically gone sideways. There hasn't been much net gain. But if you right. look at technology, this has been just a rocket ship to the upside. And that has carried the entire S&P, the entire NASDAQ to new all-time highs. And I do think that puts it in perspective of asking, okay, is this really a broad-based rally or is this somewhat of a fluke where technology is just controlling the markets? And this type of chart makes me a little bit cautious going into the next few weeks to months. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, the Magnificent Seven really pulling everyone along there. Uh, last time you were on, you did say that there was a chance that Bitcoin could drop to 15,000 or even below that because of fear entering the marketplace that we just discussed, especially if stocks start to underperform. What would be that, that trigger for you? Do you still have 15K Bitcoin on the table for this year? Yeah. So as a technician, I, I've isolated once we broke through 30 to 32, that's where that 40 to four, 48 to 50,000 target came in. And what we really know is that that 30 to 32 level is right here on the charts. And we could see how it was the low of the, uh, the mid portion of the bull market here. 
And when we came up to it under here, it was resistance. It rejected it. Resistance rejected. Finally broke out. So in the near term, if it pulls back to 30 to 32, I'm a buyer at that level. Now, what I will say, and you ask me, well, what, what's the scenario where we get to 15,000? If you really saw a bad recession hit, I mean, and again, we, we know that there's so many negatives out there, but so far, the to be honest, government spending is just insatiably filling those holes, right? I mean, we've seen the Fed, and this is an interesting stat, we've seen the Fed balance sheet drop by a whole $1.5 trillion from $9 trillion to about $7.5 trillion. The U.S. national debt in that same amount of time has gone up, what, $3, $4, four trillion dollars. And so you have to understand is that the Fed has supposedly been tightening monetary policy, but instead the government has been spending at crazy breakneck speeds that has overcompensated. And that explains a lot of why the overall equity markets continue to push up. But at some point that breaks. And at some point we will slip into a recession. At some point the Fed can't avoid it. And that's where I do worry that Bitcoin could head back down. So if you see, to answer your question simply, if we saw a 50% drop in the stock market, um, I do think you'd see Bitcoin retesting that 15,000 level. After a 50% drop from where we are currently in the S&P. Yeah, it might, it might be a little less than that, but I guess the point is is that it would be a right. big corrective move, a big recessionary move where what we would discover is that inflation is not necessarily going back to 2%, and it puts the Fed in a quandary where they can't necessarily cut rates as much as they want. And if we get into a recession and the Fed can't cut rates because inflation remains high, how do we even get out of a recession? I don't even think the market knows anymore how to get out of a recession without Fed stimulus. You know, Gareth, I don't think the market or anybody knows what a recession is anyway, these days. No. I and mean, we've got GDP coming in at what? 3.3% latest reading, higher than expected. As you said, largely driven by government spending. A lot of people at home, they are feeling a recession. There's just yeah. like a huge disconnect between what no, the data is telling us, what people are feeling, what the markets are telling us, what, what people have in their bank balance and what the grocery bills are like. So, that, and, uh, and that's the truth of it. I, and you, people have to understand that is that you have basically a small percentage of the population. You know, the, the wealthiest 1% have double, tripled their, their net worth since COVID. Everyone else has been struggling for the most part because of inflation. And, and again, it's a big issue where you've had this divergence and we continue to see the middle class disintegrate. The, 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 the poor continually, that group is growing and the wealthy just get wealthier at the top. And it, it is an issue. There's no doubt about it. Most people already feel like we are in a recession. Right. But let's get back to Bitcoin. And you're saying, you know, that you will see uh, a turn downwards if the data as contrived as it may be takes us there. If it doesn't, right, if, if we carry on in this la-la land of government data looking good and inflation seemingly coming down and equity markets continue to go up and no official recession according to whatever definition of recession we use these days, what does that mean for Bitcoin, especially keeping in mind we do have the halving, which is expected to happen in April. And, you know, we, we do still have this demand expected from these 11 spot Bitcoin ETFs. So what's your upside read on Bitcoin then? So, so if we talk about in terms of, let's just say everything comes up Goldilocks for Bitcoin and we continue to see risk on and we continue to see money printing, which obviously makes Bitcoin an even rarer commodity out there. I think what you have to start to do is you have to start looking at the all-time highs at 69,000. And I would dare say that you probably are even looking at 100,000. Now, I still don't think that's the likely scenario here in the short term, but I do think that if everything continues as is with no recession, no risk off, then yeah, you're going to head back there and it'll just be a matter of time before that bid comes back in. Again, the more money in the system, people have more money to put towards Bitcoin. And I think that, you know, the government, I don't know if they're discounting people's kind of observance of what's going on or if the if the politics just don't even allow for it. But at some point, people are going to turn and say, listen, the dollar at some point becomes a depreciating, at well, it is a depreciating asset even now, but even more so at a breakneck speed. And that's where Bitcoin can really take off to the upside. Right. And I know long term you are bullish on Bitcoin for those reasons that you just yeah. mentioned as a hedge against fiat debasement and devaluation. And we'll get into the Fed and potential cutting and even quantitative easing in a bit. But I'm just trying to get a straight answer out of you, Gareth. You know, All you've right. been spot on with your calls in, in the scenario that you see happening. And I know you're a TA guy and I know you're a daily trader. Um, but where do you see Bitcoin by, say, May of this year. 
Uh, I think I think it's tested thirty to thirty two thousand by May. So at least we're back down to thirty to thirty two thousand. That's that's the big level. That's where I will start to buy pretty heavily at that level. And then if we do see risk off, I'll have to be monitoring that position whether I want to just dollar cost average if it goes below that, or if I want to cut it and then rebuy lower. But thirty to thirty two thousand is my level. There's about as direct as I can get. <laughs> okay, no, that's 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 very direct, Gareth. And I always appreciate it. So at that point, you're starting to buy again, or you nibble. Yeah. Along That's the way. monster, like monster technical support, a b- beautiful retrace from the $49,000 high. Uh, that would be absolutely where I start accumulating. And then what kind of event do you think would get a hitting uh, going upwards again? I think I think just that. I mean, if we really get in this scenario where the economy has this soft landing, maybe a very minimal recession, and the Fed is able to cut interest rates and start printing money, and, and things just kind of deteriorate in terms of the money printing again, then that's going to kickstart upside in a massive way in Bitcoin. And I do agree. I think the, the spot ETFs are a huge turning point. It makes the, the retail crowd even more likely. Grandma sitting at home, you know, at some point, she's going to start to see that she needs to put some money in Bitcoin pension funds as well. And it does start that upward momentum that will escalate as they they print more money, essentially. Right. Now, you mentioned the retail crowd, and that's quite interesting because we did have a study coming out from Deutsche Bank, a survey on retail investors. And again, these spot Bitcoin ETFs are supposed to be appealing to those mom and pop investors. And the bank polled 2,000 retail investors in the US, UK, and the Eurozone. And here are the results. Just want to get your thoughts on these. Over one third of people saw Bitcoin dropping below 20,000 by next January. About 15,000 expected the price to be between 40,000 and 75,000 by the end of this year. And 42% of those surveyed said that they think Bitcoin will disappear in the coming years. Now, again, this is a Deutsche Bank survey of random retail investors, not necessarily people who understand Bitcoin, understand the markets. But what do you make of that? Now, granted, yeah, it, not your field. You're a technical analysis, but I know that you also look at like general fear and sentiment. So what do you make of that? Yeah, so to me, right away, that tells me that there's still a large percentage of the population that's probably very skeptical of it. They're kind of on the Jamie Dimon side with some of his comments recently. And that also tells us that eventually those buyers can be convinced maybe that Bitcoin is something for the longer term. So I think that's an interesting factor. I also think that there was so much damage in this bear market done by people like SBF and Celsius and other things that it just makes, even with the spot ETFs being approved, there's still a large percentage of the population that is still going to remain very skeptical until they see more institutional adoption, more bigger players like a Jamie Dimon turning around and starting to talk about it, that it could go higher. We see, we've seen that with BlackRock, but at the same time, BlackRock has a product they're trying to sell. So you want to see people that maybe don't have as much skin in the game starting to talk about it in a positive light. And I think that will help convince more people that it's going to go up versus down or go away. Yeah, Jamie Dimon recently speaking at uh, Davos in Switzerland saying he still thinks Bitcoin is a pet rock and dismissing its value, uh, calling it worthless and hyped up fraud as he has in the, in the past, uh, and also said that this is the last time he's going to be talking about Bitcoin. So so he claims. So he claimed to CNBC. But, but he is very bullish on this whole tokenization trend and on blockchains. And, and we've seen JP Morgan start to adopt that. But, you know, that's a whole other conversation what are your what is your outlook though on a few other altcoins? I know you tend to watch those, especially as we see Bitcoin start to find its its footing here. Yeah, so if we take a look at the chart here, we have uh, an Ethereum chart, and Ethereum obviously initially rallied to the upside on that spot ETF approval. The concept there was that we now have an Ethereum ETF that could be approved later this year. Now, we did see Ethereum pull back. I'm going to flip to a bigger time frame. So again, we saw this initial move up here, and then we've seen Ethereum come back in. Now, Ethereum is trading at a technical support level around 2140. This is really important for it to hold. If it breaks this, you could be headed towards 1700. But right now it's holding that technical level upside resistance is 25 uh, 2700 and again if we break through that you'd likely see 3000 now again in terms of my bias here i'm going to let the levels do the talking if we break below this trend line right here then i start looking for that bigger move down as long as we hold this we could be headed back within a couple months maybe to those upside targets of 2700 even 3000 and again that would be on i assume the narrative that eventually the the SEC will approve that Ethereum ETF. Now, a couple other charts out there 
Ethereum, uh, Solana, right? So let's take a look at Solana. Now, if we remove all these trend lines, let's just keep it as simple as possible and put one trend line in. Look at this break point that we just saw. So you can see how this trend line price followed it over and over again and is even hit here, here. But look, it broke it here. So what this tells me is that Ethereum uh, or Solana, excuse me, is now vulnerable as long as it stays below this yellow trend line. And again, right now, you'd think that this probably has further downside after such a monumental run to the upside. So as long as it stays below this trend line, which currently sits around 97, 98, I would be slightly bearish on on uh, Solana until it retraces probably at least until about the $65 level. All right. And circling back to Bitcoin, because I want to get some kind of positive headline from Bitcoin okay. from you. Sure. You, you still see a likely drop to 32000 by May. Yeah. That's your scenario. Right. So, but, so you don't see it going up from now. You just see it going down to around 32000 in May. But still, long-term outlook. Yeah, so long-term outlook is insanely rosy, and I want to be clear on that. You know, uh, a lot of people look at me as a bear. I'm a trader, right? So when I think it's going down, I'm going to short it. When I think it's going up, I'm going to go long. Those are my short-term trades. Longer term, I remain since the very beginning that this is probably the digital gold of the future, and we're seeing the adoption kind of going in that direction with the ETF approval. So again, for me, it's just all right. Well, if it wants to go down, sure, let it go down. I'll either short it and make money, or I'll wait to buy it at this level right down here, and then we'll look for that big bounce and potentially that next bigger move up. So, so yeah, definitely, definitely overall longer term, very rosy. Um, it's just to me, do I know if in, in six months or a year, it's going to be at new all-time highs? I honestly don't know. Um, those longer term predictions are so, so hard. <laughs> right. Okay. But overall long-term positive. We did Hugely start to long. touch on, on the macro data. And again, so much of this is dependent on how the macro data is perceived, what the Fed does according to it. So let's just circle back on, on those GDP numbers. Uh, we had, uh, as we just discussed, potentially questionable, but stronger than expected growth in the fourth quarter. Uh, this is, uh, it, it was came in uh, at 3.3 increase as opposed to 2%. So it's quite a dramatic increase over there. What does this mean in terms of what your expectations are from the Fed here? Yeah, so I was looking at the Fed Watch tool just a little while ago, and interestingly enough, even with the stronger data, we're now seeing that there's now back on the table a 50% chance of a Fed cut in March. And as of this morning, that wasn't the case before the GDP number. So, so even with the strong GDP, the market is looking past that. They looked at durable goods orders today. They looked at um, also jobless claims jumped 25,000. And I think, again, if you hear what's being said in the earnings conference calls from the likes of Citigroup and some of these other ones, they're all talking about laying off upwards of 10% of their workforce. And again, those jobless claims starting to jump may be signaling that it is starting. The snowball is starting to roll down the hill. So I do think that, again, based on what I'm seeing is, is we are likely headed to a recession by the second half of this year. Now, how deep of a recession? That's going to be the question. And then where is inflation? Where is that going to be, which will tell us how much the Fed can cut? Right. But then we also have an election year. As you know, Gareth, and nobody wants a recession and a down economy and the market's down during a, 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 an election year. So how do you see that factoring into this? Yeah. So, so to be honest, I, you know, I know in general, everyone assumes an election year, they won't let the markets fall. But I would just like to point out that in 2008, that was an election year as well. And we had one of the worst market drops. In fact, Lehman Brothers failed. And I still remember vividly, you know, Obama comes in and, and within a few months of him being inaugurated, the markets bottomed and went on one of their most incredible runs to the upside. So it's still a possibility that we could still have a corrective move. And I do believe that the Fed and the whole economic scenario is probably more dominant than the whole, you know, the election cycle. Now, just keep in mind, I mean, government spending obviously is a big deal here. And if they keep spending like that, it could often push off that recession a little bit longer. Right. Which, of course, are, you know, very long term bullish indicators for gold and for Bitcoin yes. to counter that government spending. I want to get into some specifics, though. Run us through your outlook for the NASDAQ 100. 
Yeah, so the NASDAQ 100, guys, let's take a look at this. This chart is really fascinating. You know, so we've been on this incredible run, new all-time highs, obviously led by the Magnificent 7 minus Tesla. Um, we did see yesterday a topping tail in the chart. Now, topping tails are reversal bearish signals. Uh, today, we opened higher. We basically closed flat. I'm seeing in the after hours a little weakness after Intel earnings and some of these other semiconductors had a little bit on the weaker side. So um, I'm in the camp that I do think we are borderline topping out in the market markets here. Um, you know, I've thought, honestly, I thought we would have topped out late last year. We didn't do that. We ran into January here, but certainly there are more signs. In fact, I've been watching the semiconductors as one of the key indicators here. And if we look at the semis, check, check this out. This is what's called a measured move in technical analysis. And we just hit it on the semis yesterday. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking the low from COVID down in March of 2020 to the bull market high that we experienced following that, which was at the end of 2021. We then know we had the correction of the bear market in 2022. That move up from 2020 to late 2021, 111 to 112 points on the SMH. Take the low of 2022, October low, and extend that exactly 111, 112 points. And what do we get? We get a measured move of equal value in the semis that we just tagged. And what we can see here, if we zoom in on this chart, the semis open today and reverse to the downside. So if the semis, and this is often said in technical terms uh, in market Wall Street players, is that the markets go where the semiconductors go. And that's been true thus far. If we see a correction in the semis, we may be looking at a correction in the NASDAQ 100. Okay, you were sure to exclude Tesla. Uh, from that conversation. And yeah, it's, it's had a bit of a, a, a down day. Shares are tumbling to around eight months low after some disappointing earnings, shedding about $50 billion in overall uh, market cap. Uh, what's your outlook on Tesla? Yeah, so Tesla got got absolutely demolished. I think one of the big things going into earnings was that while all the other Magnificent Seven were making new all-time highs, Tesla was just chopping sideways. And part of that, again, is is the fact that Elon Musk was cutting the, the prices on Teslas continually for the last year, basically. And that's just margin contraction, right? And again, to be honest, it, it tells me that there's probably more downside to go. We do have a technical level of support at 177 right here. That would be a 618 retrace from the low of January to the highs here in July. Um, but if it breaks that, you're probably headed towards 144. And I could easily see that if the markets start to come in, that might be the destination for Tesla. And again, Tesla's now become a, a poster child, in my opinion, for what will likely happen to NVIDIA. And the reason I say that is because Tesla was the only game in town when it came to EV vehicles that were stellar, right? Mm -hmm. But then every other EV maker, every other car maker kind of came to market with their EVs and margins contracted dramatically. If you look at the margins NVIDIA has been showcasing in their last earnings calls, it's been incredible. 80% margins, whatever it's been. But again, every other semiconductor company out there is attacking those chips, starting to build their own, and margins are going to come down. Margins are not going to stay at 80% or more for the foreseeable future they will start contracting. And so, again, you know, it's been NVIDIA to me is what Tesla was in 2021. And I do think at some point it runs out of steam and will have a major correction to it. All right. I get that point and that it's a lot easier when, you know, you're monopolizing the marketplace and that other characters uh, come into town. You've got to start adjusting your prices. But there's also a narrative change, arguably, Gareth, one could say, with regards to EV that the shine is sort of waning off them in terms of the sentiment, especially as we hear like Ford can't sell any EVs. Well, anec anecdotally speaking, we've got, uh, you know, people struggling, especially in this kind of weather to charge their EVs, getting stuck in the middle of the road in the middle of winter. It seems like the whole narrative on EVs is starting to lose a little bit of luster. And on the contrary, it feels like the AI narrative for NVIDIA and the other semiconductor stocks is still pretty much very hyped. Yes, and you're right about that. I mean, there's no doubt about it is that things top out when things are the most hyped, right? So if we go back to 2021, when we were up here at the top on Tesla, the EV story was still at the height of its its glory, right? But ultimately, that was the top, and we can see the track that it took after that. So I'm, I'm still in the camp that I think that the production, you're going to see China producing tons of chips. We know that the U.S. government yeah. has restricted chips, so they're going to go gangbusters in producing these chips. We've seen Meta stockpile like 600,000 of these 
these chips, at some point, they're going to stop buying. And also, these other chips like AMD's new chip are going to come on the market and start flooding the market. So, so again, I think that usually just like uh, it's a buy the rumor, sell the news, this is now getting to that point on NVIDIA and the chips and the AI stocks where you're now getting to that heightened point where it's probably as good as it's going to get for margins. All right. Uh, let's talk about then silver because it does play into both of these stories with EVs and semiconductors. What's your outlook there? Yeah, so silver's been trading in a very choppy range on like, on like, well, it's been like gold in that it's chopped sideways. The difference is it's been kind of consolidating and going lower. Look at this beautiful wedge pattern. Now, wedge patterns tell us just that. It's just that price has now been chopping in a sideways tightening band for longer periods of time. As a technician, you look and connect the lows. You can see how we hit the low each time here, and you do the same thing with the highs. And essentially, you look for which way price breaks. Now, again, you have silver, which is an industrial metal plus a store of safety versus gold, which is the pure play safety play. Um, for me, I think silver eventually breaks out as a safety play. But the industrial side has been keeping it down much, much more than gold, which has been hovering just around its really all-time highs, right, versus silver's way, way off those all-time highs. So, again, the bullish – I have a bullish kind of mid- to longer-term outlook on silver. Um, but in the shorter term, you have to be aware if the U.S. economy starts to stumble, silver could still struggle here a little bit. Okay, and we're going to wrap up with gold. Where is Gareth on gold? We do know that uh, gold hit that all-time high in December of last year. Spot gold trading at around, what, 2020 an ounce right now, uh, down about 2.2% uh, year to date. You continue to be bullish on gold? I do. I do. I love how it's staying so close to the all-time highs. You know, if you look historically at markets that are hitting new all-time highs daily, that's a risk on trade. And usually that means gold sells off. Gold has not been selling off. The We've continued to see these, in, in these, these central banks just buying more gold than they have ever bought before. And the fact that gold is staying so close here when markets are at all-time highs, imagine if we get that risk off where people start to panic, where does that push gold to be, right? Where does it push gold when interest rates start to drop even more? because the economy starts to come in here substantially. So one of the things I'll show you guys is what's called a, a head and shoulders pattern. And again, I'm trying to bring it up here. Let me see where it is. There we go. It's a head and shoulders pattern, classic pattern right here. We have the left shoulder. We have the head right there. And we have the right shoulder here, right? So essentially, when you break out, you break out above here. And you can do a measured move from this low pivot here to the neckline. That's about a $450 move. You would anticipate upon the breakout that we would get that same sort of move to the upside of $450, which takes us to my target of around uh, 525 to five, 20, excuse me, 2525 to $2,550. So I am still exceptionally bullish on gold. And I think, I think the price action is as dead as it's been. That's actually a huge positive for gold considering the risk on trade. Wait, so you're seeing gold at 2,500 by when? I would say by end of this year, early next year. So end of this year, early next year, you'll see that move take place. I think if we look historically, take, take a look at this, right? So you had the same pattern formation back in 2014 through 2019. Notice how it kept on hitting and hitting and hitting. And when you broke out, it took about one year for it to go up this entire amount from essentially 1300 all the way to that 2075 high, I would generally expect that one year to be the, the same thing. So when we get that breakout look approximately 12 months out, we should be hitting that $2,500 and change target. Are you ready to call a support level or a bottom for gold for this year? Yeah, so I mean, you know, if we're talking within a hundred bucks, yes, I, I do think so. Um, again, doesn't mean we're gonna hit right up and break out here, and this is the lowest point. But I think again, you know, could it fluctuate a little bit if the stock market continues to go up, if interest rates uptick a little bit? Sure, but overall, um, I would say I don't think we're going below nineteen fifty on gold. What I love about you, Gareth, is you like and are happy to be specific with your calls, and that's why we like to bring you back on when you're correct. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So always good chatting with you. Final thoughts, Gareth. Just, I do think that people have to be aware. I mean, don't have your head in the sand. See, see the numbers, see the Fed balance sheet, see the government spending, understand the, in, in, the, the inability for this to last forever. 
And you have to be on the contrarian side here where everyone's claiming for a soft landing or clamoring for it and thinking that's going to happen. Even the Federal Reserve and Janet Yellen are saying that. And if you look historically, the Fed has almost never engineered a soft landing. So just be ready for the unexpected. The right. VIX shows incredible complacency out there. I'm in the camp that we start to see some serious volatility within a month. You know, it is interesting that we're seeing such complacency in the VIX, especially, and I know that's not necessarily your department, but when you throw in these bigger geopolitical developments that can happen. Everything from, what, about 60 elections taking place in the world at the same time, constant uh, flashpoints in terms of escalating geopolitical tensions and around the world. I mean, so many things that are just not being reflected in the VIX. And, you know, and you know what that is, right? It's, it's that the market has this unrelenting reliance that the Fed will bail us out of any situation. And that reliance is like a, a drug addict to its, its drug dealer. And it's not a healthy thing. Um, and the market at some point will break away from that and people will be very surprised. All right. Well, we will have you to help uh, guide us through those twists and turns and shocks and surprises. Gareth, always good catching up with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Gareth Soloway. And as always, thank you for watching. For me, Michelle McQuarrie, and the rest of the Kitco team, we will see you next time. And if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to subscribe.